Well, a political row has erupted between former Premier Peter Beattie and Queensland's current leader over the state government's economic recovery plan. Peter Beattie has revealed an 11-point plan putting a greater emphasis on tourism in an attempt to restart the state's struggling economy. In my exclusive interview with the former leader, Peter Beattie says Anastasia Palaszczuk is the slight favourite to win the October election, but says he wasn't doing, she wasn't doing herself any favours by giving him a backhander over his job creation ideas. Peter, I'll always be a Queenslander to the day I die. That's where my heart is. As you know, I went to uh, live in Sydney when I was chair of the NRL and I've stayed on for family reasons. But look, it doesn't matter whether I'm temporarily living in Sydney or not, it's the power of the ideas that matter. And I think, Peter, the key to all this is really a very simple one. We are, we've got our backs against the wall, in a sense, because of the coronavirus. And we need to think post-COVID in as many ways as we can, but we also need to think how do we manage it leading up to that, co that post-COVID period, which hopefully will be sooner rather than later, but it won't be that soon. And that's why, Peter, I'm suggesting some fairly practical things, and I would have thought the power of ideas is what, what matters. We need to get the best ideas so that we can actually implement them and look after not just Queensland, but the whole of Australia. And some of the things I've talked about, Peter, as you know, aren't complicated, but they're practical and sensible and will create jobs. And I'm happy to talk about them. Well, let's talk about them. Cutting red tape. Now, uh, it sounds obvious, but it's very difficult to do, particularly in this environment where, uh, since 2015, the Palaszczuk government has put on so many public servants. How would you cut red tape? You know, it's not that hard. Yes, it, it's a challenge, but there are practical advice practical me mechanisms to do that. Queensland has got a coordinated general. A lot of states don't have them. But what the coordinated general can do is actually drive major projects and take control of them, if you like. Speed up the process so you've got an engine room in government that can deliver. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go through the appropriate environmental assessments and all the rest of it, but you can set timelines. Now, what we need, everybody knows, Peter, that the biggest driver of jobs is major projects, both in the public and private sector. And that's why you need to have, as far as I'm concerned, someone who can deliver it. And that's why the Office of the Coordinated General is central to that. And secondly, there needs to be a, a partnership with the, with the private sector, where you get public-private partnerships to deliver projects. The, the speedier that projects can be delivered, the quicker that red tape can be cut, the sooner that you'll get jobs and economic growth. And this is a time when we need that. And that's the first, one of the, one of the 11 suggestions I've made. Well, I love the suggestion around phasing out stamp duty and replacing it with the land tax. Now, of course, New South Wales and Victoria are considering that as we speak. I think that would be a massive fillip for the embattled property industry. Well, Peter, you know as well as I do that the housing sector and construction is one of the big job drivers. And uh, look, the New South Wales government is certainly considering it. It makes sense that if you say to someone, look, instead of paying $150,000 in stamp duty when you buy your house, here's an opportunity for you to pay, look, I don't know the figures, I, obviously it depends on the value of the house, but you can pay $1,500 a year in land tax. And the beauty about land tax is that it's an, it's an equity driver. So in other words, the more money you've got, the more you pay for the house, the more you pay for land tax. So in other words, it'll encourage first homeowners, it'll encourage the ordinary Australian family into the housing sector, it'll make houses cheaper and it'll drive construction. I think it's a sensible idea. I applaud the New South Wales government for doing it. But there's a few other things, Peter, I think we can do. You know, in this COVID period, more and more people are working from home. I mean, you and I aren't in the same studio. Normally we would be. Why? Because of COVID. Right. Now, that's going to change how we work. That's going to change how we live. We need to work, and this is one of the suggestions, on a strategy to encourage more and more people to work at home permanently. Now, out of that, you will get, for example, you take a young family working in Sydney. Now, you know, Sydney's expensive. Housing's expensive. They may think, look, I can go to Queensland and I can end up buying a house for half the price. But my difficulty is I work in the head office in Sydney. If we can get the right technology, the right strategies, they might go to the job one day and every fortnight in Sydney for a day, but they can actually relocate to Queensland. And you and I have been around long enough to know that in the late 1990s, interstate migration drove the Queensland economy. Now, that's a smart mm, thing that we absolutely. ought to do. If we get that technology right, 
then frankly, you drive companies. There's a company here called Megaport. It's a Queensland company, and they do cloud technology. Those are the sort of companies that you would grow and you would get economic, economic growth out of it. But you've got to be smart, you've got to be strategic, and you've got to make sure you put the effort in to use your best brains to get those outcomes. Payroll tax relief. Well, Peter, you know this. We use payroll tax relief to get Virgin to, to locate the headquarters here. They were going to Melbourne, and I rang Richard Branson and said, don't sign anything until you talk to us. So we gave Virgin Airlines a $10 million deal, and then out of the result of which they end up with employing thousands of Queenslanders. And that $10 million, $6 million of it, was made up of, if you like, postponed payroll tax. So in other words, they didn't pay it initially, but they then phased it in, they started paying it over a number of years. That was worth $6 million. But if they hadn't have come here, they wouldn't have got the jobs anyway. We wouldn't have got the payroll tax anyway. So in other words, it was $6 million for nothing and the jobs came to Queensland. At this time, the corporate sector does need as much support as they can get. And the way to use payroll tax is very simple. If you're an innovative company, you're a smart company and you want payroll tax relief, locate yourself in Queensland. Now, this is a time in this, this COVID time, Peter, where you've got to be imaginative and strategic in government. And using payroll tax to achieve that result is one of the ways to, to get a, a, a relocation and a creation of new companies right here in Queensland. You better than anyone know the importance of tourism to the economic renaissance that's required here. You're talking about some sort of travel bubble between New Zealand and even partnering with New South Wales. Well, look, the sense of this is New Zealand has obviously done incredibly well in fighting the, the COVID virus. There are problems, as we all know, in Victoria. So, that, I mean, I don't want to go down that road. Victoria is doing what they can to alleviate that problem. But Queensland, in my view, can't sit there just waiting for things to happen in other states. The key to this is to talk to New Zealand. Now, they may or may not, but one of the ideas is to have a travel bubble between Queensland and New Zealand. Now, New Zealand tourism industry depends significantly on overseas tourists. Now, they're not going to get those for many years, so what's the biggest neighbour they've got? It's Australia. And if you can guarantee protection and you can create a bubble, then the number of tourists coming out of New Zealand and vice versa for Queensland would be significant. Now, I think New South Wales Health is fighting the coronavirus very effectively. They've got issues in those hotels. The border with Victoria is currently closed. If the bubble with New Zealand could work, and you've got two Labor governments, so I can't understand why they can't talk. You've got a Labor government in coalition, admittedly, in New Zealand, but a Labor government in Queensland. If New South Wales can get their COVID under control, you could then include New South Wales in it. But you've got two mm. big states, New South Wales and Queensland, it makes sense to partner with your biggest neighbour until Victoria gets the COVID virus under control. So you gradually roll out economic development as the states get COVID under control. You can't sit on your hands I mean, the issue with all this, Peter, is really simple. The federal government's programs with, with JobKeeper and all the rest of it are great programs, but you, someone's got to pay for that at the end of the day. The country will go broke if they stay on forever. So what we have to do is drive economic growth. We've got to be smart about how to do it. And the same with Hong Kong. Now that there are issues in the Australian government, I applaud what the Australian government's done in relation to Hong Kong. There are a whole lot of companies there looking for investment, looking for relocation. You've got to be strategic about engaging with them and long term getting them to locate here as well because out of that will come technology, the latest research and a lot of money to develop innovative companies. That's the sort of thinking I think we need to have in this COVID period. What about super funds? you think they can play a role? Absolutely. I mean, the, there's trillions of dollars in Australian super absolutely trillions of dollars. They've got to look at where are their investment opportunities. COVID has changed the world. And those people who think that it's going to go back to business as usual the next year are dreaming. This is on for a long period of time. We're not going to have a vaccine for 18 months, two years. I mean, I hope it's sooner, but that's where we are. Now, superannuation funds are looking for investment opportunities. They're looking for big, long-term infrastructure investments where they can get a reasonable return. Queensland has got all that. The COVID rate here, and congratulations to the government for this and the health department, the COVID rate is very low here and it's mainly, in fact, it's all overseas visitors. So you're a safe place to, pardon me, to invest. You've got major infrastructure opportunities. I've talked about water. We need a national water grid. 
Here's an opportunity to invest in alternative energies in terms of water. I mean, obviously there are projects around Burdekin that could, we could use Queensland water as part of a national water grid. There's an opportunity for, for the super funds to invest in. Of course, they've got to stack up. But at the end of the day, they're the sort of opportunities that, that you can talk to the superannuation funds about. They're looking for opportunities. Here's a chance to engage with them. Now, I know you're in our other Brisbane studio and you've got a flight to catch to head back to New South Wales. You were pretty <laughs> kind, I thought, on Anastasia Palaszczuk in the opening remarks there. I mean, I thought it was disrespectful. You've come up with some ideas and she's basically used that you know, jingoistic term, oh, well, he lives in New South Wales. Do you think she can win on October 31? She's under a bit of pressure here. Well, look, I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, politics in the post-COVID period is, is really strange, Peter. I think she's got a nose ahead. I think if I had to put my house on it, uh, I, I would probably say she'd get re-elected. I'm not engaged in politics or involved in politics anymore, so my judgment is probably not as good as it could be on who's going to win elections and who's not. Look, you know, in politics you've got to let things go. I went to Sydney, as you know, to chair the NRL, as I said, and uh, I've stayed for family reasons. But at the end of it, I'm a Queenslander, I'll always come home. You've got to let those things right, roll off your back. I think it's going to be an interesting election campaign. Governments normally do well when there's a crisis and the Premier has to show leadership and on a day-to-day -day basis that's inevitable and, and therefore that favours the incumbent government. I think she's a favourite. But frankly, it's the long term that matters here, Peter. It's whether there are positive ideas for the future of Queensland and indeed the future of Australia. And I don't think it's wise to sort of backhand anybody, whether it's me or you know, John Howard or anyone else that comes up with good ideas. If they're worth testing, you still... My, my mantra in government was you steal the best ideas regardless of where they come from. You then use them and mm. claim them to be your own. That's a smart politics.